Let me just find out how many of you were not here last night. Oh my goodness, okay. Well, let me try and uh, get you up to speed a little bit. I started a series last night called Surviving the Anointing. Surviving the Anointing. I read a number of uh, statistics. I won't go and uh, read them all over again. I'll just give you one of them. And uh, it is that there are 1,500, these are American statistics now, 1,500 ministers a month leaving the ministry in America. That's every month. Now, those statistics uh, go back to the 90s, so that has increased, uh, I imagine, uh, a great deal. But that translates into 18,000 men, women of God in some cases, who have had a call of God, some sort of preparation, gone into uh, seminary or gone into a Bible school of some type, and then ended up with a flock, a congregation, and yet uh, 18,000 a year leaving the ministry. The number one reason, sexual immorality. Number two reason, burnout, just exhaustion. Number three, third re reason, contention in the local congregation. Now, we know that doesn't happen in Ireland, so uh, <laughs> the sheep can be pretty mean sometimes, can't they? But... Um, I could read on many, many other statistics, but the Bible is full of individuals that began well. You remember in the Old Testament, there was a king, the king of Assyria, by the name of Ben-Hadad, who went to war against the king of Jerusalem, and uh, at least the king of Israel. And the king of Israel wrote him a letter, because he was bragging, and he says, don't brag about putting on your armor, brag if you can take it off. In other words, it's one thing to go to war, it's another thing to be able to end up triumphant, to be able to take your armor off. And I think spiritually the same thing is true. Paul's uh, great fear in one sense, he says, lest when I preach to others, I myself should be disqualified. And so if it's possible to disqualify ourselves, uh, obviously that applies to all of us. I said uh, yesterday that uh, we have that incredible example, or maybe a terrible example would be a better word, of the children of Israel. It begins in the latter part of 1 Corinthians 9, where Paul says, every single one of us, the moment we are born again of the Spirit of God, we begin a race, the Christian race. And it says we all run that race, and Paul exhorts us, run in such a way that you may win. And he says, I run in such a way that I may win. I buffet my body, I discipline myself, and so on. And then he goes right into chapter 10, there's no chapter divisions originally, and he picks up the same thought and he says that we all run in the race, and he says, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, all of our fathers, meaning the entire nation behind us, they were all in that same race. They all passed through the sea together, they all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, they all drank the same spiritual drink, they all ate the same spiritual food and so on, and, and so he takes that word all, and he picks it up again in the first part of 1 Corinthians 10, and he, then he says, but nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, they died in the wilderness. And out of two million people, estimate around two million people that came out of Egypt, two of them made it across the finishing line, so to speak, made it into the purpose of God, the promised land. And Paul goes on to say, all these things are recorded, they're written for our instruction, upon whom the ends of the earth are. In other words, for us at the end of this age, that is the example that we are to look at and remember, not everybody makes it. And so I am uh, looking at uh, how to survive the anointing. I said the anointing, uh, if you're not famu uh, familiar with that term, is uh, the equivalent of somebody that's lived all their life in poverty and then they come into an, a, a, a colossal amount of riches. You know, somebody dies, they're left millions and millions of dollars, and uh, now they're able to do things they could never do before. They have the ability, because of the money that they have, to buy the fanciest car, live in the fanciest home, travel abroad, eat at the finest restaurants, and so on and so forth, and their life is radically changed. And that is uh, similar to what the anointing is all about. In other words, we're average, ordinary individual. We may not have much of a gifting, speaking-wise, or singing, or whatever. The Spirit of God comes upon us, and we find that we have God's riches, if you like, God's ability given to us, and we are able to do things that we could never do before, and we have to acknowledge this is the grace of God on my life. God gave me this gift, whatever that gift may be, and so on. And uh, we're able to do things, again, that uh, we can never do in the natural. 
but can we steward that in such a way that uh, we can make it last? In fact, we can increase it. You know, and I cited, and I won't again go into it, I have a, an article here that talks about people that made millions of dollars. They won them on the lottery. And uh, up to uh, one man had uh, 16 million, another 31 million, another one 11 million, another one 5.4 million, and so on. And the one common thing about all these people that made that vast amount of money or came into that vast amount of money is that within a matter of years, they'd squandered the whole thing. Some of them ended up in prison. Some of them ended up bankrupt. Some of them didn't have enough money to pay their taxes. And yet at one time, they were just uh, overflowing with... Uh, an abundance of money, but they were not able to use it wisely. And the same thing is true spiritually. Many a man, a woman of God, has been given a gift uh, from God, and yet they have not been able to steward that in such a way that they have uh, been able to make it to the end of the race, so to speak. And um, as a result, they've allowed pride to come in. They've uh, got into sexual immorality or some other thing or some sort of uh, false doctrine or whatever it may be, but they have not uh, made it, if you like, as Paul says, I finished the race. And uh, each and every one of us need to finish the race. My longing is that I finish the race. 73 years of age now, and you know how many more years I've got left, I don't know, but uh, I want to finish the race. I began that race at the age of 18. I'm still running it by the grace of God. I've not stepped out of the bounds, I hope, and, uh, but I want to finish it. But I can't uh, rely on my own ability. I've got to constantly rely upon God Himself. And so we looked at uh, the Lord Jesus Christ as being our example on how to survive the anointing uh, because the book of Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2 says, leaving us an example that we should follow in His steps. Now, I know the context of that is speaking about suffering, but Jesus is our number one example. He is the one that we are to follow. He is what I call the pattern son. And uh, if we have a pattern, then we can follow that pattern. You ladies know what it is. Uh, maybe years ago when uh, many of you made your own dresses, you would go to the shop and you would buy a pattern. And as long as you had the pattern, the dress turned out okay. If you try to do it without the pattern, maybe not. And uh, we have a pattern spiritually. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. We are to set our minds and affections again on, uh, on the Lord and uh, do what He has called us to do, walk in obedience to His Word, and, and so on. And, uh, and so, using Jesus as an example, the, the very first thing that we talked about last night, and the very first principle, if you like, or the key uh, thing, is the word dependency. Dependency. Jesus made it abundantly clear that He was absolutely dependent upon the Father for everything that He did. He says, I don't initiate anything, I don't create anything, I don't try and make things happen. He said, I simply am dependent on the Father. Whatever the Father tells me to do, that's what I do. Whatever I see the Father doing, then I know what to do. But he says, I don't initiate a single thing. Then he said to his disciples, apart from me, you can do nothing. In other words, if I can't do anything, I'm your role model, I'm your example, then you can't do anything. Don't try and do things in your own strength. And uh, so we were talking along that line. We looked at a number of scriptures. I just want to uh, pick up a couple uh, more before we uh, move on tonight. If you have your Bible, turn with me to uh, 2 Kings. You don't have to f turn to it, but if you want the, uh, the reference at least. And it is a uh, familiar portion of scripture. It's the story of the woman who had uh, lost her husband. Her husband was a man of God. The Bible makes that very clear. Not only was he a man of God, he was a man that traveled with uh, the prophets, and in this case, he was a companion to Elisha. And uh, we don't know how he died, if it was an accident or what happened, but Elisha comes maybe to pay his condolences to this widow, and when he gets there, she is in dire straits. She is uh, uh, just uh, in a very terrible situation. She has sort of maxed out her credit cards, if we could modernize it, but she's in debt. And so um, much in debt that uh, she is under the threat of losing her two sons. Now, I'm assuming that those two boys were teenagers, that they, uh, you know, had energy to burn, so to speak. They were useful. They could be 
uh, make good slaves. I don't think the little infant children, nobody wants to take on a couple of two-year-olds and train them up and so on. They're not uh, worth anything to the average master. And so I'm assuming that here, you know, she's lost her husband, possibly her, her best friend in the world, and now she is about to lose her two sons. Maybe her sons were literally keeping the place going. Maybe they were out in the field and doing a little bit of, you know, uh, looking after the sheep or whatever they had and so on. And so uh, the prophet comes, and uh, she, again, is in this situation where she says, um, thy servant, my husband, is dead. Notice, thy servant. In other words, he served with Elisha. He traveled with Elisha. And uh, she says, and you know that my servant feared the Lord. In other words, you know about my husband. He wasn't a stranger to him. You know that he was a man of God. He feared God and so on. But he says, the creditors have come to take my two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said to her, what shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? Now, I'm assuming that he'd been in that house many times. Maybe there was a little prophet's chamber, as some people call it. And uh, this man would pass through occasionally and look in on his friend, or maybe they travel together. And maybe he remembers that in the house there were a number of uh, items that uh, had some sort of value. Again, if we were to modernize it, maybe he's been in the house and he sees a Roland piano and he sees the organ. And he says to her, well, well you know, I, I know you've got some debts, but, uh, you know, what about some of those things you had in the house? Why don't you sell the Roland uh, uh, keyboard there? It's got to be worth a couple of thousand dollars, and what about the organ, and, and so on. And she says, listen, we, we have, we've sold everything. We don't have a single thing in the house. All the furniture's gone. Everything is gone. We have only got, all I've got is this little jar of oil, and that is it. We're down right to that jar of oil. We don't have another single thing in the house. And Elisha, as you know, he said to her, he said, uh, here's what you need to do. Go around the neighborhood, go to your friends, go to your neighbors, and get as many vessels as you can. And he emphasizes, borrow not a few at the end of verse 3. In other words, the command was, don't, get, don't just get one bottle or two bottles or three bottles don't stop at just a few. Get as much pos as you possibly can. And then he says, when you've gathered all those bottles, go into your house and shut the door. What does that sound like to me? It sounds like Jesus speaking to his disciples. When you pray, go into your house and shut the door, or go into your closet and shut the door, and then pour out what you have. And I think sometimes some of us need to pour out the little bit of residue, if you like, that we've got left. God, I'm right down to the bare minimum. Lord, I'm just about ready to give up. I'm just about ready to throw up my hands. I can't take the church anymore, or I can't take the ministry anymore, or I can't do this. I'm right down to this last drop of grace, if you like. And what we need to do is get alone with God, shut the door, and then begin to pour out. And he says, set aside what is full. There was a great man of God in America, I've never forgotten it, who many, many years ago I heard him say, and... Uh, I, I want to get to this one point. He said this, the more emptiness you can present to God, the more of his fullness you can receive. Let me say that again. The more emptiness, don't get a few, get as much emptiness as you can. Because the more emptiness you can present to God, there is greater amount of filling that can take place. And many of us are so full of ourselves, you know, there's not very much left. We're full of our own ability, we're full of our own training, we've been to Bible school, we've done a course in this and a course in that, and so on, and you know, there's about that much room left for God. And sometimes God has to strip us, sometimes God has to empty us, He's got to just tip out everything and bring us back to that place of desperation, where we go to the man of God, in this case we go to, the, uh, to God Himself and say, God, I don't have a single thing left. But all I have is an empty vessel. Fill my cup, Lord. There was an old a chorus many, many years ago. I don't know if it came to this country or not. Here's my cup, Lord. Fill it up, Lord. You know, and we need to come to God. And the more emptiness, again, you can give to God, the more of His fullness you can receive. And uh, many of us, again, need to come to that place where we acknowledge, Lord, I'm dry and uh, I'm thirsty. And Lord, I'm just going to get into that closet. I'm going to shut the door and I'm not going to come out until... There is a change that takes place, a radical change. In, in other words, the Spirit of God did something that was miraculous. It was not a natural thing. You can't take half a cup of oil or a quarter of a cup of oil and in the natural pour it into vessel after vessel and see every vessel filled. It has to be supernatural. 
we need the supernatural activity of the Spirit of God. Otherwise, we'll never make it. We can't do it on our own strength. We can get there and we can pour away all day long and nothing will happen. You know, we'll just fill another cup with a quarter of a cup and then we'll take that quarter cup and fill another cup. But at the end of the day, we've got a quarter of a cup left. It's got to be the supernatural work of God. God can take a few loaves and fishes and feed 5,000. He can magnify, he can multiply, and we've got to believe that he can do that in our own lives. In uh, Ephesians chapter 6, we are told there that we are to put on the whole armor of God, and then Paul says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. We've got to know what it is to draw on the strength of the Lord Jesus Christ, not our own strength. Paul says, who is sufficient for these things? If anybody was sufficient to preach the gospel, Paul was the man to do it. He was a colossal mind, colossal intellect. He was brilliant. Again, he had the pedigree that everybody wanted, you know, everything about him. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisee and so on and so forth. But he has to come to that place. God brought him to that place where he says, I am not sufficient. I can't draw out of my own ability, out of my own gifting, out of my own training, I am totally relying upon God. God himself is sufficient for these things. Another place, the very next chapter, in fact, in 2 Corinthians 4, I think it is, he says, um, we have this treasure in an earthen vessel. Again, every single one of us here is an earthen vessel. And it's the treasure is the power of God, the power of the presence of God in our lives, that we need that. Otherwise, we're just earthen vessels. We will never accomplish a single thing It has to be the filling of the Spirit of God that does the work in us and through us. And so Paul says we are to be strong in the Lord, not in our own strength. I remember when I was a little boy in England, used to walk home from school, and I had to walk through uh, uh, another school, not walk through a school, but walk by another school of uh, larger, bigger children, older children. And invariably, if they saw me, they would run after me and catch me and grab my little satchel from the back and uh, scatter my books everywhere and my pens everywhere and send me home crying. And I used to, you know, just loathe walking that way home, but it was uh, the quickest route. And many times if I saw them, you know, coming, a bunch of guys, I would slip down a back alley. We had the little back alleys in England, and I would make my way home another way. And I was afraid of those boys. But occasionally my father would come to school and pick me up. And uh, I was no different than the day before. I was always a skinny little kid when I was uh, younger. And... uh, Believe it or not, I put on about, I don't know how many stones since I've been married, but, uh, you know, my nickname in Bible school was Bones because I used to rattle when I walked virtually. You know, I was skinny. But uh, I I didn't have much strength. But my father would come to school, and I could walk along beside my father and face that same group of kids and do all the rude things that you weren't, weren't supposed to do, you know, be very cocky and thumb my nose at them, so to speak. And, you know, I wasn't any stronger than I was the day before, but I was strong in my father's strength. The Bible says be strong in the Lord. Learn to draw from Him. Learn to call upon the Spirit of God and say, Lord, I can't do it. Again, unless you build the house, we labor in vain to build it. We have an example of that over in the uh, book of Exodus. And then we'll move on here in a few uh, minutes. But uh, it's a story, again, I'm sure you're familiar with many of these stories. It's a a story of the children of Israel coming out of uh, Egypt And as they uh, start off in the the wilderness, they're confronted by the Amalekites. And the Amalekites, of course, were out to try and uh, destroy uh, the children of Israel. The Bible says they picked off all the stragglers at the rear, those that were not keeping up with the rest of the body, so to speak, that were just sort of lackadaisical. In fact, the word that is used there means to flap. They were sort of back and forth like the flapping of of a... of a flag or something in the wind, that's the term that is used there as they came out. Certain ones were just sort of, you know, not really concentrating on what was going on ahead. And the Amalekites came in, and of course Moses uh, takes Joshua, commissions him, tells uh, Joshua to go and fight against the Amalekites. In the meantime, we know the story, Moses goes up on the mountain, and along with uh, Aaron and Hur, he begins to pray. The battle goes on all day. And after a while, Moses gets weary and his hands droop down and uh, they notice something that takes place. A change takes place in the battle. And then Aaron and Hur are perceptive enough to say, you know, every time Moses drops his hands, the battle 
wages against us. The Amalekites prevail against us. They are killing our people. And so they raise his hands up. One stands on one side of Moses, the other stands on the other side. They hold his hands up. And as long as his hands were raised, uh, Joshua is able to overwhelm the Amalekites. Now, <clears throat> I normally use a different translation, and so I had to uh, check it out. I uh, brought along an old uh, King James here. But I notice in the margin it says this. In verse 16 it says, Because the Lord has sworn, the Lord will have war with Amalek, from generation to generation. But in the margin, you will notice, at least in the, this uh, King James margin, right down the middle here, it says, because the hand of Amalek is against the throne of the Lord. And then it says, that's an alternative uh, reading, but then the literal reading in the Hebrew is, the hand upon the throne of the Lord. There's two ways of looking at that uh, portion of Scripture. One is that the Amalekites came against the throne of God. In other words, they came against God's people. And so God says there's going to be war with Amalek from generation to generation. And in fact, tells Moses to write it in a book, not to forget it. The day is going to come when he says, you know, vengeance is mine. I will repay. I'm going to destroy the Amalekites one day. So, you know, make sure you record that because that day is going to come. So there's that aspect. The other aspect is this, because a hand is upon the throne. In other words, Moses was touching the throne of God. And as long as Moses had his hands raised, he was touching God. He was drawing from the power of God. Men ought always to pray what? Lifting up holy hands, symbolic of touching the throne of God, of being in contact with the throne of God, the power of God. And as long as uh, uh, Moses was in contact with the throne of God, he was able to overwhelm the Amalekites. The moment he lost contact, we see the Amalekites gaining. And the same thing is true in your life and my life. The moment we lose contact with God, you will find the Amalekites, the sinners, the Bible calls them, that sin will prevail in your life. You cannot fight sin in your own strength. You cannot fight discouragement or whatever it may be in your own strength. You need to constantly have a hand upon the throne. Again, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. And so we developed uh, last night this whole thought of uh, surviving the anointing and the key and the foundational truth, I believe. And I, I put this to the test, at least in my own uh, ministry over the years. And uh, Nancy and I met in Bible school. This is our I think 52nd year of uh, full-time ministry, which is a long time these days. But uh, finally, a, a verse there in the Song of Solomon, uh, chapter 8, and it uh, is the uh, verse 6, where we have the bride, and of course you know that Song of Solomon typifies the, the bride and the bridegroom, the relationship. It's a very intimate book of uh, speaking about the relationship of the bride and the bridegroom. It was so intimate that many of the um, Orthodox Jews would not allow the teenagers to uh, read the book of Song of Solomon. They felt it was too, uh, too pornographic, I guess, uh, for people that were not married. So it's a very intimate book. But at the end of that book, we have the bride coming up out of the wilderness, and the Bible says she was leaning on her beloved. And of course, we have that famous hymn or song that uh, many of you may know, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. What a fellowship, what a joy divine leaning. That's the place that you and I have to come to and remain in that place. We are the bride. He's the bridegroom. We are to draw our strength from him. It is leaning constantly. I'm leaning on the everlasting arms. I'm not putting any strength in my own ability and, and my own training and so on. I'm in that place of absolute uh, dependency. So that's a little bit of a refresher plus a couple of extras uh, thrown in there free of charge. So now that you're up to speed with me, uh, the second one that I want to look at tonight, and uh, this won't be quite as long, is intimacy. Intimacy. In John chapter 14, again, in each of these, at least the, the first ones, we're using Jesus as our example. And Jesus makes this statement in John uh, 14 and verse 10. He says, the Father abiding in me does the work. In other words, he reveals the secret to his life and how he operated. He said, it is the Father that abides in me that he's doing the work. And of course, then he goes on to say, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, the only way that a branch can uh, bring forth fruit if it continues to abide again on the tree. If you cut that branch off, there may be fruit on it, but it will ultimately wither and die. 
And the same thing with you and I. We cannot be independent. We cannot have, uh, we, we, we can't uh, survive without that abiding relationship. Note that it is not visiting, it's abiding. There's a lot of people in America, they talk about, you know, a visitation from God. And uh, many, many years ago now, I felt God said to me, David, I'm not interested in visitation. I'm interested in habitation. There's a vast difference. Nancy and I are visitors in uh, Northern Ireland. We are visitors. We don't abide here. This is not our abode. But Jesus said, we will come and we will make our abode. We won't just visit. And, uh, and so Jesus said, you know, I abide in the Father. We have that ongoing intimate relationship. In fact, he says, who is in the bosom of the Father. That's the, the place that Jesus was, even on earth. He was in the bosom of the Father, meaning that intimate relationship of abiding with him. <clears throat> and then he says, we need to be in that same place. If we abide in him, then we will be fruitful. And uh, just as in any uh, fruitfulness, it takes a intimacy. Isn't that right? The very fact that everybody, everybody that is in this room is a result of intimacy. Intimacy between a husband and wife. Um, we are the offspring, if you like. We are the fruit of that intimacy. The same thing is true in the natural. You cannot have uh, fruitfulness at a distance, so to speak. I guess uh, technically possible these days, but uh, in the natural. You cannot be fruitful unless there is an intimacy. And spiritually, the same thing is true. The reason we see so little evidence of a genuine move of God is that we are trying to produce fruit in our own strength without that intimate relationship. In uh, Mark chapter 3, and this is uh, a portion of Scripture that I'm sure you have read like I have read many, many times, and uh, many times we read things without really seeing things. It says, uh, the background to this, of course, is Jesus has spent the night on the mountain. He comes down and he appoints the 12 disciples. And so it says in verse 14, Mark chapter 3, verse 14, he ordained 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out, uh, send them forth to preach and to have power to heal sickness and to cast out demons. Now, you'll notice something. Jesus did not come down the mountain and appoint 12 disciples to go out to preach. Let me say that again. He did not appoint 12 disciples to go out to preach. He appointed 12 disciples to be with him and then to go out to preach. I have a good friend, he's a New Zealander, and it must have been 35 years ago now, something like that, we were talking together, and he drew my attention to that verse, and he said, David, you realize we have no right to go out to preach until we've spent time with him. And that was a revelation to me. Jesus did not just come down the mountain and say, hey, I'm going to send you out to preach. He said, no, I'm going to appoint you to spend time with me. And after you've spent time with me, then you can go and preach. You see, preaching really is if you like, in a crude sense, it is selling a product. I don't know if you still have door-to-door -door salesmen here in Ireland. Uh, they're sort of few and far between in America, but you go back 20 or 30 years, and we would have people knock on your door on a Saturday morning, and they would be selling uh, brushes and selling uh, vacuum cleaners and all sorts of odds and ends, but, you know, let me refresh your memory. Uh, let's say there's a knock on the door on a Saturday morning, and you, you open the door, and lo and behold, here is a very smartly dressed salesperson, uh, we can't say salesman anymore. That's not politically correct. <clears throat> so you've got the salesperson, and uh, they're holding some sort of a gadget. And they say, oh, I'm so glad you're home. What's your name, Dean? Oh, Dean, so glad that you're home today. Is your wife here? Maybe she'd like to uh, join you. We are so excited. You know, we represent the uh, whatever it is, uh, big company. And uh, this is one of the most exciting products we've ever been able to offer. You know, it started in Japan, it sold thousands and thousands, it swept over Europe, this is the first time it's come to Northern Ireland, and uh, we have a special this weekend, I mean, this thing, you can't live without this thing. 
It's amazing. We've had all sorts of reviews on it. It's one of the most outstanding products of the 20th century, and normally it sells for 200 pounds, but we have a special, you know, if you buy it today, it's only 65 pounds, and they go on and on. Very articulate, very smartly dressed, you know, good communicator, and then you finally get a word in edgewise, and you say, well, uh, what exactly does it do? And the person looks at you. That's a very good question. Um, I don't know. Can you imagine a salesman not knowing his product? You see, as Christians, again, excuse the crude illustration, we are selling a product. Paul says, I preach Christ. I sell Christ, so to speak. Now, how can you sell something or preach something that you don't have a clue about? That's why Jesus said, listen, if you are going to represent me, you've got to hang around me a little bit. Notice the way John begins his epistle in view of that. In 1 John, the very first verse there, that which is from the beginning, which we have heard which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifest, and we have seen it. We bear witness, we show unto you the eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifest to us. John says, listen, let me tell you about him, because I've seen him. Let me tell you about him, because I've heard him. Let me tell you about him, I've touched him. Let me tell you about him. He's been manifest to us. I know exactly what he's like. Therefore, I can manifest him to you. That's how important it is. So he appointed 12 that they might be with him. And then he sent them out to preach. Why? They were his representatives. It's no wonder then that later on those disciples were called Christ-like. Isn't that right? Why? Because they acted like him, they spoke like him, they had the same mannerisms, if you like, the same actions, the same attitude, and people say, you, you remind me of that, uh, that man they crucified a couple of years ago. You know, that Christ. Uh, are you a Christian? You, you act just like him. You talk, yeah. yeah. It was a nickname given by the community. Yeah. In fact, I uh, teach uh, much to uh, the chagrin of a lot of people that there is... Uh, a difference between being a disciple and being a Christian. There's a whole bunch of books in America that have come out in the last number of years trying to get the church back to discipleship. And I said, well, I, I know what they're saying and I know what they're trying to accomplish, but biblically I disagree with it. In other words, I, I was uh, teaching a bunch of Bible school students, uh, actually Mennonite uh, young people, back in the, the first part of the year, and we had about uh, 40 uh, or 45 students, and I said to them, would you rather be a Christian or a disciple? How many of you would rather be a Christian? How many of you would rather a disciple? I said, how many of you would rather be a disciple? And every single hand went up. I said, you'd rather be a disciple than a Christian? They said, yes. Now, I know what they were thinking in their mind. A Christian is here. A disciple is up here. A disciple is somebody that's a little more serious and a little more dedicated and so on and so forth. But I said to them, I said, you're all wrong. I said, a disciple in the Bible was simply a student. The Bible says John had disciples. Jesus had disciples. There's a verse that says Paul had disciples. The Pharisees had disciples. And the Pharisee even said, we are disciples of Moses, or were Moses' disciples. So what was a disciple? A disciple was simply a student, a follower. But what was the purpose of being a student? It was to become, Jesus said, it is not enough, or it is, it, it, it is enough for a disciple to become as his master. We had a young lady playing the violin here. I would, would to God I had all the money back that I spent on violin lessons for my daughter. But uh, anyway, uh, she plays a lot better than she did. But uh, imagine if this young lady had the opportunity to play under one of the world's greatest violinists. Somebody like Isaac Perlman. I don't know if he's alive or dead these days, but he was one of the great uh, violinists. And let's suppose that she 
sits at his feet day after day after day after day. The years go by. She has five years of tutoring by Isaac Perlman. And then she has her first major recital. And the newspapers have as a heading, so-and-so plays just like Isaac Perlman. In other words, Jesus said she has arrived at her goal. It is enough that a disciple become as his master. That's the whole purpose of discipleship, to become as your master. And the Bible says the disciples were what? First called Christians at Antioch. A disciple that arrives at his goal is called a Christian. Now that's biblical. I know we've turned it around because the word Christian is so watered down and we've sort of upped the ante on discipleship, but it really biblically it's the other way around. It's enough that you become like your master. And they were called Christ-like because they'd arrived at their goal. They talked like him, acted like him, had the same vision, and so on and so forth. So, again, let's get back to intimacy for a moment. <laughs> I don't know how I got drifted off there. I am um, eternally grateful to two men in my own life. Uh, one, of course, was my father who set an example for me in uh, just about every area, but certainly in the area of prayer. I observed my father. Uh, I'm not sure when I first became aware of it. I have a very poor memory of the, uh, my young years, uh, five, six, seven years of age, but certainly from there on, I would see my father praying and uh, watch him as I grew up uh, praying and praying hours a day. In fact, at the age of 87, when my father passed away, just prior to that, I was visiting him and uh, staying in the house, and I heard in the middle of the night the door creak, and my father come out, and I knew he was going to his office, and he would spend somewhere uh, around 1 to 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, almost every single morning, he would uh, get up and spend two hours alone with God, as well as uh, several hours a day uh, during the day. But he reckoned he got his best time of prayer in because the phone wasn't ringing, people weren't knocking on the door. But that was his discipline. He was a man of prayer. And he set an example for me that I am eternally grateful for, not that I've ever reached that amount of praying in my own life. The other man was a man that I had the privilege of working with for 15 years in New Zealand. Uh, he has since gone to be with the Lord. His name was Peter Morrow. Nancy uh, knew him very well, and our children uh, uh, were best friends with uh, his children. But uh, Peter was a, a man. We had uh, a church that uh, grew very rapidly over the years. We ended up with about 2,000 people in that congregation. We had a great big old, what used to be a former uh, theater building in the middle of Christchurch, New Zealand, which is the biggest city in the South Island. And uh, we had offices. We had four floors of office space, uh, plus an auditorium that uh, would uh, seat around 1,500, and then a stage that was almost as big as this entire room where we could get two or 300 people just on the stage alone. And uh, God bless that work. And you would have thought that the senior pastor would have a nice fancy office, you know, up on the fourth floor where all the other offices were. Not that they, they, not that they were that fancy, but we had offices there. But he would spend most of his day in prayer. And he had a little room at the back of his bedroom, possibly a sort of little walk-in closet at some time. It had a window in it. He had a bunch of bookcases, a little uh, chair, and he would spend hours in prayer. But every once in a while, the phone would ring down at the main church in the center of town, and the uh, receptionist, uh, uh, the secretary would uh, call my office and say, David, Brother Peter's on the phone, he wants to talk to you. And I'd pick up the phone, and Peter was on the other end, and he'd say, uh, David, he said, I'm coming into town later on this afternoon, do you have time for a milkshake? And milkshake was always code, if you like, for just getting alone with the senior pastor. It meant we could have a cup of coffee, tea, whatever it was you were wanting to have, but he would uh, take the elevator up to the fourth floor of that uh, building, and uh, knock on my door, and he said, are you free? And I said, sure. We never said no. And uh, we'd, uh, you know, walk down and uh, find a little coffee shop somewhere in town. He would always find a, a table somewhere at the back in a quiet place, and he would begin to ask me questions. And uh, how's your marriage getting along? And, you know, like a typical male, you say, fine. You know, and he'd point his long, bony finger at you and say, come on, tell me what's really going on, you know. And you'd end up spilling, you know, things out that you never intended to tell any man. And it wasn't that he was being no, uh, uh, nosy. He, he, he genuinely had that pastoral heart. He wanted to know, how are you really doing? Be honest with me. 
But somewhere in that conversation, it happened many, many times over the 15 years, he would uh, ask me about my prayer life. And he would say this, remember, David, I don't ever want you coming into the church office until you've spent at least an hour on your face before God. And he would say that over and over and over again. It was a busy church. Like I say, we got as, uh, as many as uh, 2,000 people at one stage. There were always things to do, always people dropping by, uh, people to visit in the hospital, as you can imagine, all of those things. But he understood something. Ministry comes out of relationship. And if you cut off the relationship, you cut off the ministry. And as a young man in my early 20s, I disciplined myself, thanks to that man, Peter Morrow. My father set the example, but this man, again, you know, demanded in one sense, don't come into the office. Not that he was ever there to check up on us, not that he ever said, you know, I'm disappointed that you weren't here or you, that you weren't in prayer. No, he encouraged us. And uh, we had a house where the garage was uh, separate from, well, it was actually attached to the house, but it was poorly designed. You had to go outside to get into the garage. There wasn't a doorway through. And it had a little room in the back of that garage that was full of paint cans when we bought it. I remember cleaning it out. It was maybe about seven feet long and uh, about uh, four or five feet wide. I put a door on the end of that little room, got some uh, carpet, put the carpet down. And every single morning before I went into that office, I would go outside and uh, rain or shine, cold or heat, go into that little room, get down on my face before God and pray. And I am eternally grateful that as a young man, there was a discipline established in my life because of that uh, man, Peter Morrow, that to this day, I, I give him credit along with my father. Again, there has to be intimacy. There is no fruitfulness possible without intimacy with God. One of the very first things that the uh, early church had to do, the first major decision in the early church had to do with the fact that uh, the disciples, as you know, were so busy after the day of Pentecost, there were thousands of people added to the church. And one of the big problems was that, of course, there were hundreds, I guess, of, uh, of widows. Uh, the Romans weren't the greatest at looking after the Jews, as we well know. Uh, there was no sort of, uh, you know, socialized medicine or welfare system, what we know. So the church was known for its compassion known for its love and its kindness and so on. And so uh, once they got saved, you know, word spread about the goodness of God and the faithfulness of God, and people would flock into the church. And of course, the disciples were in the kitchen making uh, whatever it was they were making, uh, making the soup and so on and so forth, until they realized, listen, we are neglecting the word of God. And so the very first decision, we need to appoint somebody else to do this practical ministry. It was a ministry. It was a necessary ministry. And they said, we will appoint men to do that, and we will give ourselves continually to the Word of God and prayer. In other words, we, we've got to forget about the natural feeding of the people, not that that's not right, it needs to be done, but our job, the very word shepherd means to feed. That's what it means, to feed. And we cannot feed the people unless we are feeding ourselves. And you and I can't feed the people unless we're feeding ourselves. We need to be in the Word of God. We need to know what the Word of God says in order to give out, if you like, the, the bread of life. And so one of the very first uh, decisions, again, was uh, we can't neglect the place of prayer. We can't neglect the Word of God. Jeremiah says, he said, if you're going to boast about anything, don't boast about your bank account. Remember, don't boast about your riches, don't boast about your wisdom, don't boast about your strength. If you boast in anything, boast about one thing, how much you know God. That is the place we should boast, not in a wrong sense, but that should be the thing that we delight in. A man boasts about his uh, strength because he enjoys being strong. He boasts about his riches because he enjoys his riches. You know, he boasts about his intellectual capacity because he's got, you know, three PhDs or whatever, and he wants everybody to know. The Bible says, listen, we should be boasting about God, that I know him, you know. And the only way you can know anybody is by spending time with them. You can take any three people in this room that are total strangers, put them in a room, deprive them of the cell phone, and leave them there for 48 hours, and I guarantee at the end of the 48 hours, those three individuals or four individuals will be able to tell everything about one another. 
you know, this is Dean, he's married, he's got two children, you know, how do I know that? Because I've talked to him. I would never know just looking at him that he's married. I would never know that he's got two children. But we spent a little bit of time together, he's driven me around and so on, got to know him a little bit, I know he's married, I know he's got two children, I know he does a lot of preaching around the place, I know things about him. Why? Because I just spend a little bit of time with him. If I spent more time with him, I guarantee I could find out a lot, a lot more about him. If I asked his wife, I could find out even more. But, uh, but it's, it all comes out of, you know, spending time with that person. We've got to spend time with God. There's no substitute for it. It's good to listen to tapes. It's good to read books. But this is the only real revelation that we have of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, let's, again, not neglect the Word of God and prayer. Uh, over in the... Uh, 1 Timothy, Paul, of course, is writing to this young man who he has left in charge to uh, rectify some wrongs that are going on. And in verse 16 of chapter 4, he says to Timothy, take heed unto yourself and unto the doctrine or the teaching. Continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those that hear or those that listen. Take heed to yourself. Now, if you put a period there, it sounds very egotistical, very self-serving. Timothy, look after number one. Look after yourself. He's not talking about, you know, pandering yourself or anything else. He's speaking spiritually. Timothy, if you don't maintain your spiritual walk with God, not only will you suffer, but the church will also suffer. And so that is the admonition. Make sure you spend time alone with God. And many times there are all sorts of things that crowd into our life, all sorts of activities that come along, and we're running around doing this, doing that, and so on. My father used to say, he said, when I go into a church, and in America especially, you, you see, you know, a, a name on the, on the office, maybe it says pastor's office, uh, but my father says, whenever I see on a pastor's door the word pastor's office, he said, I think of administration. When I see on the door pastor's study, I think of meditation. In other words, we can get so busy with organization, you know, making sure this person's doing this and that, and of course, when a church is small, the pastor has to be the jack of all trades sort of thing, but the sooner he can delegate that and get alone with God. I had the privilege many years ago of being in London and uh, speaking to, um, all of a sudden his name is gone now. He wrote the book, R.T. Kendall. Some of you have uh, read maybe some of his books, Great uh, Man of God. He took over after Martin Lloyd-Jones, an uh, American man. But um, I went and w we met there at uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the church, Westminster uh, Chapel. We went into the room. I was with another, another friend. We had lunch uh, together. At least uh, we brought our own lunch, a brown bag. And uh, we were talking to this man. He was asking some questions about the group that I was a part of in the States at the time uh, and so on. And I remember looking at his office and thinking, you know, this is not a very impressive, uh, impressive office. He's got some nice leather chairs. It's got a bookcase, but there's hardly any books in the bookcase. And the, the desk was uh, absolutely immaculate. There wasn't a piece of paper on it. Everything, you know, it didn't look like anybody even worked there. And I came to find out that was true. Because after a while, our hour was up, and he said to me, I need to get back to my office. And my ears sort of pricked up a little bit. He said, which way are you going? And my friend, who was uh, uh, directing me around, he said, we're taking such and such a uh, subway. And he said, oh, good. He said, that's on my way to my office. And uh, he said, oh, yeah. He said, this is not my office. He said, I just, uh, he said, I meet people here, but I don't study here. He said, if I studied here, I would never get anything done. There's always people coming into the church, and he said if the door was open or whatever, they'd be looking in, hi, Pastor, how are things going? And he said, I would lose my concentration. He said, I have an office across town. Nobody knows where it is. That was the day in which we had the, the little pages instead of cell phones. He said, my secretary has my pager number if she needs to make contact. But he said, apart from that, nobody knows where it is. And he said, I can give myself continually to the Word of God in prayer. And I thought, there is a man that really has had an impact around the world with much of his writings and revelations and so on. Why? Because he understood the priority of being alone with God. Now, I recognize that not all of you are called to the ministry in that sense, but the same thing is true. The greater you uh, 
the greater the man or the woman of God, you can trace it to the fact that they've spent hours along with God. And uh, we need to get back to that place. Otherwise, we will not, again, survive uh, the anointing. It's, uh, it's impossible. And so, uh, we haven't got as far as I thought I would. I'm going to switch uh, tomorrow and uh, go on to uh, the next area. I don't want to begin it right now. But I, I think I've said enough to at least hopefully convey to you the importance. I know I've been repetitive in many things, used different scriptures hopefully, but uh, we cannot afford to neglect the place of prayer. We cannot. We've got to spend that time with God. We've got to spend that time in the Word of God. I'm seeing more and more in America an absolute neglect to the Word of God. I have a friend that started a church in Houston about six years ago, went door, door to door, knocking on doors, started from scratch. He now has maybe 200 uh, plus people, but he said he spent one year going around different congregations in, uh, in Houston just to get the pulse, if you like, of what was going on. And he said there were so many churches, he said, I, I literally was ready to walk out of, and he said, my wife as well, they never opened the Word of God once. Maybe one single scripture is all you heard. Again, there is a dearth of the Word of God today, and we've got to get back into it. And that's indicative of what's going on in the lives of so many people as well. And uh, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And we've got to say, and I need it as much as anybody else, we've got to say, Lord, you know, increase my appetite for the Word of God. Increase my appetite for prayer. Be honest with God. I remember being in a prayer meeting many, many years ago in New Zealand. We were praying for revival, and there was a pastor there that began to pray, and he said, Lord, you know I don't have any desire for revival whatsoever, but he said, I want to be willing to have a revival. You know, sometimes we can pray for things, and if we're absolutely honest, we couldn't care less about it. We're doing it because everybody else is doing it, or we're doing it because it's one of those words that, you know, we think is, you know, going to do something, and so we pray, but deep down, and we've got to be brutally honest. We've got to be brutally honest about our knowledge of the Word of God and our hunger for the Word of God and say, God, whet my appetite again. You know, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word, we've got to have that desire placed back in us. You know, we've got the television, everything else, and I succumb to that as well, and all of the, you know, these days it's, it, we've got so many temptations, or should I say distractions. I'm not talking about sinful things necessarily, but Paul says all sorts of things are expedient, uh, or lawful rather, but they're not expedient. And we've got to get back to the expediency, if you like, of the Word of God. Shut out all the other distractions and get along with God. So that's the second if you like, key or principle to surviving the anointing. The first one, absolute dependency. If you have absolute dependency, then you will pray. If you, and so you can see there's, a, there's a, a logic to what I'm saying here. You know. If you don't, then you, you don't need God. In other words, if you, can, if you can make it on your own or think you can, then you're not going to need to pray or study or anything else. But if you are absolutely dependent, if you're aware of your own bankruptcy, your own inability, it will drive you to that place of uh, seeking God. You say, Lord, I can't do it. I need your help. Let's just uh, close in prayer. Father, I pray tonight. Lord, I pray for myself. I pray for my wife. I pray for every brother and sister in this building tonight. God, give us a fresh appetite for the Word of God, a fresh appetite for your presence. Lord, just to spend time alone with you, to learn to recognize your voice. Lord, to learn to be led by your Spirit. Father, bring us back to our first love. Father, we acknowledge there's so many things that are crowded into our life over the years. Father, strip us of all those things, Lord, all the barnacles, if you like, that build up. Father, this place is called a lifeboat. Lord, that lifeboat can be dragged down, as it were, by barnacles that stop it from going through the water fast enough and efficiently enough. And Father, we ask, Lord, spiritually, Lord, just to rid us of all the barnacles and all the things that would try and hold us back. Lord, laying aside every weight, your word says. 
and the sin that has so easily beset us and let us run again with patience that race that is set before us. Again, Lord, whet our appetite. In Jesus' name, amen.